So this video is for those of you who are studying to take the final for Calculus 2. Let's begin with this problem. Feel free to pause the video and try it yourself. Number one, find the indefinite integral. So what is the antiderivative of x squared sine x dx? What technique do we need to use? We need to use something called integration by parts. The integral of u dv is equal to u times v minus the integral of v du. So what should we make u equal to and what should be dv? I'm going to make u equal to x squared so that du is going to be 2x dx. dv, I'm going to make that equal to sine x dx. Now the antiderivative of dv is v. So what is the antiderivative of sine? The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So the derivative of negative cosine is positive sine. So it's going to be negative cosine x. So thus, we're going to have uv. So this is x squared times negative cosine x minus the integral of v du. So that's negative cosine x times 2x dx. So just so you could see it, the u part is x squared. And the dv part is sine x dx. And so here, this is uv. And this is the integral of v du. So this is negative x squared cosine x. Now we can cancel these two negative signs. So right now we have plus the integral of 2x cosine x dx. Now we need to perform integration by parts one more time. So I recommend making u 2x so that du is going to be 2 times dx. Let's make dv cosine x dx as uh, we can see here. And then v, the antiderivative of cosine, is sine because the derivative of sine is cosine. So using this formula again, but particularly this portion, we're going to have equals negative x squared cosine x and then plus uv, so u is 2x, v is sine x, and then minus the integral of v, which is sine x, du. So that's 2 dx. So right now, let's get rid of this. And we can get rid of this stuff as well. So we have negative x squared cosine x plus 2x sine x. Now I'm going to take the 2 and move it to the front. So it's minus 2 and then times the integral of sine x dx. Now, we know what the antiderivative of sine. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. So this is going to be negative x squared cosine x plus 2x sine x, and then minus 2 times negative cosine plus c. So now we can write our final answer. So the original problem is equal to negative x squared cosine x plus 2x sine x. And then we could cancel the two negative signs. So it's plus 2 cosine x plus the constant of integration, c. So this is the indefinite integral of x squared sine x using integration by parts. Number two. How can we find the indefinite integral? So what we have in this example is a trigonometric integral. And so we need to use u substitution to get the answer. But first, 
we need to modify this integral a little. So cosine to the fifth power, we're going to write that as cosine x times cosine raised to the fourth power, because 1 plus 4 is 5. Now, cosine to the fourth power, I'm going to write that as cosine squared x, and then squared again. When you raise one exponent to another exponent, you need to multiply. 2 times 2 is 4. And then I'm going to have sine to the fourth power x, and then cosine x dx. So this cosine that was in the front, I decided to move it towards the end, and you'll see why. Now, cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared. Based on the trig identity, sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Notice that all of the cosine terms have been converted into sine terms except 1. So we're going to use u substitution now. We're going to make u equal to sine x. So du is going to be cosine x dx. So we can replace cosine x dx with du since they're equal to each other. And everywhere we see a sine term, we're going to replace it with the u variable. So we're going to have 1 minus u squared squared and then u to the fourth power and then replace all of that with du. So right now what we have is 1 minus u squared and I'm going to expand it. We have two of them and then times u to the fourth du. So let's FOIL. So 1 times 1 is simply 1 and then we have 1 times negative u squared plus negative u squared times 1 so that's going to be negative 2u squared and then finally negative u squared times negative u squared is positive u to the fourth now our next step is to distribute u to the fourth to the trinomial inside the brackets so it's going to be u to the fourth because if you multiply it by one you get the same thing and then negative 2u squared times u to the fourth that's negative 2u to the six two plus four is six and then u to the four times u to the fourth is u to the eight now at this point we can find the antiderivative of each term so using the power rule for integration the antiderivative of u to the fourth is going to be u to the fifth over five add one and then divide by that number next is going to be negative two six plus one is seven and then divide by seven the last one u to the nine over nine and then plus the constant of integration now we're not quite finished yet there's one more thing that we need to do and that is we need to replace the u variable with sine x so the final answer is going to be 1 over 5 sine to the fifth power minus 2 over 7 sine to the seventh power and then plus 1 over 9 sine to the ninth power plus c. So this is it. So that's how you can find the indefinite integral of a trigonometric integral using u substitution. Now let's move on to our next problem. Find the indefinite integral. So what can we do for this particular problem? So this is a trigonometric substitution problem. We need to make x equal to either sine, tangent, or secant. Now because it's x squared plus 9, we're going to use tangent. Because 1 plus tan squared is secant squared. If it was like 9 minus x squared, I would use sine. If it was x squared minus 9, I would use secant. But now because of the 9, we need to use 3 tangent theta. I need to utilize more space. So let me just move this to the left. Now x squared is going to be 9 tan squared theta. 
the derivative of x is dx. The derivative of 3 tangent theta is going to be 3 secant squared theta, but times d theta. Now we also need x cubed. So if we cube this equation, we can see that x cubed is going to be 27 tangent to the third power. Now our next step is to replace. So let's begin by replacing x cubed with what we see here. So that's 27 tangent to the third power. Now let's replace x squared with 9 tangent squared. So we're going to have 9 tan squared theta plus 9. And then let's replace dx with what we see here. So that's going to be times 3 secant squared theta d theta. So now what we're going to do next is we're going to factor out a 9 on the bottom of the equation. So we're going to have square root 9 times tan squared plus 1. And then on top, we're going to have 3 secant squared theta times d theta. Now the square root of 9 is 3. And tan squared plus 1, or 1 plus tan squared, we know is secant squared theta. And the square root of secant squared is going to be secant. So right now we have 3 secant theta on the bottom. And we still have this on top. So we could cancel a 3, and we can cancel secant. Secant squared divided by secant will leave us one secant term on top. So right now what we have is the integral of 27 tangent to the third power times secant theta d theta. So we no longer have a fraction. Now what can we do with this expression? This integral sign is a little bit too big. What should we do at this point? Now, we need to use another substitution. But how should we do it? We know that the derivative of tangent is secant squared, and the derivative of secant is secant tangent. How can we utilize that so that we can convert theta into a u variable? What we need to do is we need to rearrange the equation in such a way that it's going to work. So first, let's move the 27 to the front. Now, tangent cube, we can write that as tangent squared times tangent theta. But this tangent theta, I'm going to put it to the right of secant theta. Now, we said that 1 plus tangent squared is equal to secant squared. So solving for tangent squared, tan squared is secant squared minus 1. So we're going to replace tan squared with that. So now we're ready to use u substitution. So we're going to say that u is equal to secant theta so that du is secant theta, tan theta, d theta. So let's replace this with u, and let's replace secant tan theta, d theta with du. So it's going to be 27 integral u squared minus 1, and then times du. So the antiderivative of u squared is going to be u to the third over 3. And the antiderivative of negative 1 is u. And don't forget plus c. So now let me just clear away a few things. So let's distribute the 27. So 27 divided by 3 is 9. So we're going to have 9u to the third, and then 27 times negative u 
that's 27u, and plus c. So now, let's replace u with secant theta. So it's going to be 9 secant cube minus 27 secant theta plus c. Okay, so now I can get rid of that, and I can get rid of this, so I can have a lot more space now. So now that we went from u to secant, we need to go back from secant theta to x. So how can we do that? Because we need to substitute this again. We need to get an answer in terms of the variable x. So this is when we need to use trig. We need to use a triangle. So we have that x is equal to 3 tangent theta. Solving for tangent, we can see that tan theta is x divided by 3. Now let's draw our right triangle. Now let's put theta here. Now based on Sokotoa, we know that tangent is opposite over adjacent. So opposite to theta is x, adjacent to it is 3. Now we need to calculate the hypotenuse. So using the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we're going to say that a is 3, b is x, and we're solving for c. 3 squared is 9, and so we need to take the square root of both sides. So c, the hypotenuse, will be the square root of x squared plus 9. Now, what is secant theta based on this triangle? Well, let's find cosine first. Cosine theta is equal to the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. So it's 3 over the square root of x squared plus 9. Now, secant theta is basically 1 over cosine. It's the reciprocal of the cosine function. So it's basically going to be that just flipped. So secant theta is going to be x squared plus 9, that is the square root of x squared plus 9, over 3 which we can write that as one-third square root x squared plus 9. So now that we have our value for secant, let's plug it in. But before we do so, let's take out or factor out 9 secant theta. So this is going to be secant squared minus 3 and then plus c. So now let's replace secant with what we see here. So it's going to be 9 times 1 over 3 square root x squared plus 9. And then 1 over 3, same thing. But this time, it's going to be secant squared. So we need to square that whole thing. And then minus 3 plus c. So we are very close to our final answer. But let's do some more work. We need to simplify it. I'm not going to multiply 9 by the 1 third in front. I'm going to use the 9 differently. So I'm going to rewrite the 9 here for now. Now let's square this term. 1 over 3 squared is 1 over 9. Once we square the radical, the radical will disappear, giving us x squared plus 9. And let me put this in red brackets so you could distinguish the brackets from the parentheses. Now let's just get rid of some other stuff. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to distribute 1 over 9 to x squared plus 9. So this is 1 third square root x squared plus 9 times 9 and then we're going to have 1 over 9 x squared. 1 over 9 times 9 is plus 1. And then we have minus 3. Now we can get, I mean, we can go ahead and combine those two numbers. So 1 minus 3 is negative 2. Now the next thing I'm going to do is distribute the 9. 9 times 1 over 9, that's going to be 1. So we're just going to have 1x squared, or simply x squared. And then 9 times negative 2, that's going to be 
negative 18. So we can write our final answer as 1 over 3 x squared minus 18 times the square root of x squared plus 9 and then plus the constant of integration. So this is it. So that's how we could find the indefinite integral of this problem using trig substitution. Number four. So how can we find the indefinite integral for this problem? Notice that the degree of the denominator is higher than the degree of the numerator. So for this problem, we need to use partial fractions. So let's begin by factoring the denominator. So the first thing we can do is take out the GCF, which is x. And so we'll be left with x squared minus 4. Now, x squared minus 4, that's a difference of perfect squares. So we can factor that as x plus 2 times x minus 2. Now, let's break it up into three partial fractions. So each of these are linear factors. And so it's going to be a over x plus b over x plus 2 plus c over x minus 2. Now, for those of you who may be looking for more complicated examples using partial fractions, I have a video on YouTube. If you go to the YouTube search bar and type in integration by partial fractions organic chemistry tutor, you should see it come up. So it contains a lot of examples, simple examples, hard examples, if you really want to master this topic. But let's go ahead and finish this problem. So what we need to do now is we need to solve for a, b, and c. The next best thing to do is to multiply both sides by this denominator. So that's x times x plus 2 times x minus 2. So if we multiply this fraction by this, the denominator will cancel. So on the left side, all we're going to have is x squared plus 12x plus 12. Now, if we multiply a over x by that, the x variable will cancel. And so we're going to have a times x plus 2 times x minus 2, which I'm going to leave it as x squared minus 4 to save space. Now, if we multiply b over x plus 2 times this, the x plus 2 term will cancel. And so we're going to have b times x times x minus 2. Now, if we multiply this fraction by that, the x minus 2 term will cancel. And so we're going to have c times x times x minus 2. Now, at this point, in order to solve for a, b, and c, all we need to do is plug in certain numbers. So let's begin by plugging in 0. When x is 0, this is going to be 0 squared plus 12 times 0 plus 12. And so all of that becomes 12. This will be 0 squared minus 4. And so we're going to get negative 4a b times 0 times x minus 2, this will disappear. That's going to be 0. And c times 0 times x minus 2, that's going to be gone. I'm missing something here. This is supposed to be, this factor is not supposed to be x minus 2 because x minus 2 was canceled, it should be x plus 2. So I want to just make that correction. One wrong factor could change the entire problem. So now let's go back to this. So replacing x with 0, this will be 12. We're going to have negative 4a, and these two terms will equal 0. So 12 divided by negative 4 is negative 3. So a is negative 3. Now let's repeat the process for a different x value. Let's choose 2 for x. So 
So this is going to be 2 squared plus 12 times 2 plus 12, and then A, then it's 2 squared minus 4 plus B times 2 times 2 minus 2 plus C, 2 times 2 plus 2. 2 squared is 4, 2 times 12 is 24, and then we have plus 12. 2 squared minus 4, that's 4 minus 4, which is 0. So we could get rid of that. 2 minus 2 is 0. Here we have 2 plus 2, which is 4, times 2, that's 8. So this is equal to 8c. Now, 4 plus 24 is 28. 28 plus 12 is 40. So we have 40 is equal to 8c. 40 divided by 8 is 5. So c is equal to 5. So now we need to calculate B. So we want the terms that contain A and C to equal 0. So in this case, we need to choose negative 2 for our x, eval excuse me, for our x value. So it's going to be negative 2 squared plus 12 times negative 2 plus 12. And then it's A negative 2 squared minus 4 plus b times negative 2 times negative 2 minus 2 and so forth. Negative 2 plus 2 is 0. Negative 2 squared is 4. 4 minus 4 is 0. So this is going to be 4. 12 times negative 2 is negative 24. And here we have negative 2 minus 2, which is negative 4. Negative 4 times negative 2 is positive 8. So that's 8b. 4 minus 20, I mean 4 minus 24 is negative 20. Negative 20 plus 12 is negative 8. So we have negative 8 is equal to 8b. So b is going to be negative 8 divided by 8, which is negative 1. So now that we have the values for a, b, and c, we can now find the indefinite integral. So let's begin by rewriting the problem, but in its factored form. So that's x, x plus 2 times x minus 2. So this is going to equal the integral of, we had a over x, so that's going to be negative 3 over x, and then it was plus b over x plus 2. So b is negative 1, so this is negative 1 over x plus 2. And then we have plus c over x minus 2. So let's replace c with 5. So this expression, or that integral, is equal to this integral. Now we're going to break it up into three separate integrals. But before we do so, I just want to go over a few things. The antiderivative of 1 over x is ln x plus the constant of integration. The antiderivative of, let's say, 1 over x plus 5, this would be ln x plus 5. So keep that in mind. So now let's break it up into three separate integrals. And let's move the constants to the front. So we're going to have negative 3 integral 1 over x dx, and then minus integral 1 over x plus 2 dx, and then plus 5, integral 1 over x minus 2 dx. As we said before, the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of x. And we're going to use an absolute value, because you can't have a negative value inside a natural log. Next, the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 2 is ln x plus 2. And for 1 over x minus 2, that's going to be ln x minus 2, but times the constant in front of it. And let's not forget plus c. So this is the final answer for this problem. Number 5. Determine if the improper integral converges or diverges. In order to find the answer, we need to evaluate the integral using limits. And if we get a finite value, let's say like 5 or negative 8, the improper integral converges. 
but if we get like a number like infinity, then it diverges. So this is going to equal the limit as a approaches infinity. And now we're going to replace my infinity symbols look terrible. We're going to replace this infinity symbol with the letter a. And then 1 over x cubed dx. Now what is the antiderivative of 1 over x cubed? Well, let's rewrite it as x to the minus 3. So using the power rule, we need to add 1 to the exponent. Negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. And divide by negative 2. So this becomes negative 1 over 2 x squared plus c. So now we have the limit as a goes to infinity. And then this is going to be negative 1 over 2 x squared evaluated from 1 to a. So let's start with a first. We're going to replace x with a. So this is going to be negative 1 over 2a squared. And then minus. Now let's plug in 1. So it's going to be negative 1 over 2 times 1 squared. Now I'm going to factor out the negative 1 half. So it's negative 1 half limit as a goes to infinity of 1 over a squared. And then the two negative signs will cancel. So this is going to be plus 1 over 2. Now what is the limit as a goes to infinity of 1 over a squared? 1 divided by a large number will give you a small number. So if you take a constant and divide it by infinity, basically you're going to get something that's very close to 0. So this is going to be negative 1 half times 0 plus 1 half. So the final answer is 1 over 2. So because we have a finite value, because we have a number other than infinity, we could say that the improper integral converges. So that's it for this problem. Number six, the table below shows the instantaneous force in Newton's applied to an object as a function of the object's displacement in meters. Use the trapezoidal rule to estimate the work done by the force in moving the object from a position of zero to a final position of 60. So we know that work is equal to force times displacement. That's if the force is constant. If the force is variable, then the work is the definite integral of the force function, where the force is a function of the displacement times dx. So we can estimate this integral using the trapezoidal rule. Now, here's the formula for the trapezoidal rule. It's going to be delta x divided by 2 times f of x0 plus 2 times f of x1 plus 2 times f of x2. And then the last one is just going to be f of xn. So delta x is the width of each interval. We can see that x is increasing by 10. So in this example, delta x is 10. And it's going to be 6. This is f of x0, f of x1, f of x2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is going to be delta x divided by 2, or 10 divided by 2. f of x0 is 100. And then it's going to be 2 times f of x1, the second point. So the y value for the second point is 150. And then just follow the process. It's going to be 2 times the next one, which is 200 and then 2 times 230, and then 2 times 250, and then 2 times 210, and then plus the last one, which is just 140. So when using the trapezoidal rule, notice that the first y value and the last one is not multiplied by 2. But all the ones in the middle, they're multiplied by 2. So just keep that in mind. Now, let's go ahead and plug everything in. So it's going to be 5 
and then parentheses, 100 plus 300 plus 400 plus 460 plus 500 plus 420 and then plus 140. So the answer that you should get is 11,600 joules. So keep in mind, this is an approximation. So the work done by this force is approximately 11,600 joules. So that's how we could use the trapezoidal rule to estimate the work done by a force given the displacement. Number seven, the table below shows the instantaneous velocity of an object in feet per second as a function of time in seconds. Use Simpson's rule to estimate the displacement of the object during the first 90 seconds. In the last problem, we saw that work equaled force times displacement. In this problem, displacement is velocity multiplied by time. And we saw that the work is equal to the definite integral of the force function where x is displacement. In this case, the displacement is going to be the definite integral from a to b of the velocity as a function of time times dt. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the displacement using Simpson's rule. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's begin with the formula. The formula for Simpson's rule is it's equal to delta x over 3 times, let me replace n with 6 because we're looking for s sub 6. So this is going to be times f of x0 and then plus 4 times f of x1 plus 2 times f of x2 and then 4 times f of x3 and then it's 2 times f of x4 and then 4 times f of x5 and the last one we're not going to multiply by anything just like the first one so in this example delta x we could see is 15 you could think of it as delta t so delta x let's replace it with 15 f of x 0 or in this case v of 0 that's going to be 15 and then 4 times v of the next point which we'll just say it's f of x 1 that's 22 and then 2 times the third point or the third y value that's going to be 36 and then it's 4 times 43 and then 2 times 41 and then it's going to be 4 times 35 and then the last one plus 26. Now 15 divided by 3 is 5 and then 4 times 22 that's going to be 88. 2 times 36 is 72. 4 times 43. 4 times 40 is 160. 4 times 3 is 12. 160 plus 12 is 172. 2 times 41 is 82. 4 times 35. 4 times 30 is 120. 4 times 5 is 20, so that adds up to 40. I mean 140. So go ahead and plug this in. So type it exactly the way you see it. So based on the Simpsons rule, I got 2,975. So the displacement is approximately equal to 2,975. Now what are the units for displacement in this problem? So we know D is equal to VT. The velocity is in feet per second. Time is in seconds. So if we multiply these two, we can see that the unit seconds will cancel. And so the displacement will be in feet. So it's 2,975 feet. Number eight, find the arc length of the function shown below. So the formula that we need in this problem is going to be the definite integral from a to b 
of the square root of 1 plus the square of the first derivative function and then dx. So we have a and b. a is 0, b is 4. The first thing we need to do is determine the first derivative of the function. So let's find f prime of x. So we need to use the chain rule. So we have the constant 2 over 3. And then we're going to move the exponent to the front. So that's going to be 3 over 2 times x plus 4. And then subtract the exponent by 1. 3 over 2 minus 1 is 1 half. Next, we need to take the derivative of the inside function. The derivative of x plus 4 is 1. Now, we could cancel a 3, and we can cancel a 2. And x plus 4 raised to the 1 half is the same as the square root of x plus 4. So this is the first derivative of the function. Now we can plug everything into that formula. So the arc length is going to be the definite integral from a to b, or 0 to 4, times the square root of 1 plus the square root of x plus 4. But let's square this value, and then dx. So this becomes a definite integral from 0 to 4. Now the square and the square root will cancel. So we're going to have 1 plus x plus 4, which is simply x plus 5. So first, let's find the indefinite integral of the square root of x plus 5 to begin with. Well, let's keep these numbers here, actually. So we're going to use u substitution. Let's replace u with x plus 5. And so du is going to be dx. So we're going to have the integral from the integral of the square root of u, du. Now that we've changed the variable x to the variable u, the limits of integration will change as well. So when x is 0, what is the value of u? u is x plus 5, so 0 plus 5 is 5. When x is 4, 4 plus 5 is 9, u is going to be 9. So we have the definite integral from 5 to 9, u to the 1 half, du. Now let's find the antiderivative. So 1 half plus 1 is 3 over 2. And then we need to divide by 3 over 2, which is the same as multiplying by 2 over 3. And let's evaluate it from 5 to 9. So this is going to be 2 over 3. And then let's plug in 9. So it's 9 raised to the 3 over 2 minus 5 raised to the 3 over 2. So now, what is 9 raised to the 3 halves? This is basically 9 raised to the 1 half raised to the third power. The square root of 9, or 9 to the 1 half, is 3. 3 to the third power is 27. So right now, we have 2 over 3, and then 27 minus. Now, what about 5 raised to the 3 over 2? What is that equal to? Now, we don't want to do it this way because this will simply give us the square root of 5. Instead, I'm going to write it as 5 cubed raised to the 1 half. 5 to the third power is 125. And 125 raised to the 1 half is the square root of 125. Now, you could simplify the square root of 125 if you want to. 125 is 25 times 5. And the square root of 25 is 5. So you can write your exact answer like this, 2 over 3, and then 27 minus 5 square root 5. Now let's get the decimal value for this answer. So the decimal value is 10.546. So this is the arc length of the function from 0 to 4. Number nine, find the surface area obtained by rotating the curve f of x equals x cubed from zero to two about the x-axis. So first we need to talk about the formula that we need. The surface area is going to be the definite integral 
from a to b of 2 pi f of x times the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared. So it's very similar to the arc length function, or rather the arc length formula, but we have this 2 pi f of x term that's multiplied to it. So let's begin by finding f prime of x. So we know that f of x is x cubed. So f prime of x is going to be 3x squared. So let's plug in everything that we know into this formula. So a is 0, b is 2, and then it's going to be 2 pi times f of x. So f of x is x cubed, and then times the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared. So f prime of x is 3x squared, as we said before. And then let's square it. So now we just got to evaluate the definite integral. So I'm going to move the 2 pi to the front. And then it's going to be x cubed times 1 plus 3x squared. Squared is going to be 3 squared is 9. x squared squared is x to the fourth. Now what do you think is our next step in order to evaluate that definite integral? We need to use u substitution. Let's make u equal to 1 plus 9 x to the fourth. So du is going to be the derivative of this. The derivative of x to the fourth is 4x cubed times 9. That's going to be 36x cubed. Now solving for dx, du divided by 36x cubed will be equal to dx. So we have the surface area is 2 pi integral 0 to 2 x cubed times the square root of u. So at this point, you want to replace this with the u variable. Now let's replace dx with what we have here. So that's du over 36x cubed. Now let's cancel the x cubed term. And let's move the 36 to the front. So it's 2 pi over 36, which reduces to pi over 18. Now we need to change the limits of integration, going from x to u. So when x is 0, u is going to be 1 plus 9 times 0 to the 4th, which is 1. And when x is 2, u is going to be 1 plus 9 times 2 to the 4th. 2 to the 4th power is 16. And 16 times 9. 9 times 10 is 90. 9 times 6 is 54. 90 plus 54 is 144. And 144 plus 1 is 145. So this is going to be 1 to 145. And so we have u to the 1 half du. Now the antiderivative of u to the 1 half, it's going to be 1 half plus 1, which is 3 over 2, and then times the reciprocal of 3 over 2, which is 2 thirds. And now let's go ahead and evaluate it. Now 18 divided by 2 is 9, and 9 times 3 is 27. So we're going to have pi over 27, and then times 145 raised to the 3 over 2 minus 1 raised to the 3 over 2. Now what is 145 raised to the 3 over 2? What is that equal to? So this is the same as, now keep in mind 3 over 2 is 1.5. So this is 145 raised to the 1 times 145 raised to the half. So 1 plus a half is 3 over 2. So 145 to the first power is just 145. 145 raised to the 1 half can be written as the square root of 145. So we can leave our answer as pi times 145 times the square root of 145 minus 1 over 27. But let's get the decimal value for this answer.
the decimal value for this answer incorporated in pi is 203.04. So that's the surface area of the function when we rotate the curve about the x-axis going from 0 to 2.